Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, depending upon where you are in the in, in the world right now. So thanks for uh, for joining us today. So um, I really appreciate the opportunity Eunice has, has given me to, to, to speak to you all. I hope you find it helpful. Uh, so based upon the poll that was done at the last uh, writer's retreat, um, the theory and hypotheses section was voted the, the topic most folks wanted to hear about and uh, discussion section came in a close section. So I'm gonna try to hit at least the highlights of of uh, some things to think about on, on that one as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, I'll probably be going kind of fast. I hope, hopefully not, hopefully this won't be too much of a, a fire hose in the face for you. But like Una said, there's, uh, she's recording this. So the video will be up afterwards if you want to watch it again. And, uh, and I also, um, you know, I, she'll also, I think, be sharing my slides with you, which she did his last time as well. So you can have the slides to look at and go over as well, because there's some of them I won't be going through in, in a super lot of detail, because I want to make sure I cover cover everything for you. So, um, so let me start. So first, the, the theory and hypothesis section. If you're here last time, you heard me talk about the uh, the metaphor of tying and untying a knot as you develop your your story. And so the rise the the theory, and I, I talked about Freytag's pyramid, which had. Uh, the, took the five act play and put it into a pyramidal shape, exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, and denouement. And so the theory and hypothesis section is where the rising action occurs and where most of the knot tying occurs. This is where you're creating the tension and you're setting up uh, the, the, the challenges that you are going to then be unraveling in your results section and showing what the, what the answers to the questions were that you have, have set up and, re and relieving the tension that you create in this section. Um, so a good, a couple of just a, by way of starting a, a good theory and hypothesis section um, elaborates on the introduction. So your introduction is kind of microcosm of your, of your whole paper, particularly this section actually and the discussion section. So it's gonna, you're, where you have touched on in your introduction, what the conversation or conversations are that you're participating in, um, in this section, you elaborate on that a bit more. So when we think about the lit review, we think about, okay, here's what we're talking about, what we know, what we don't know, why it's important. And um, also, this also follows on the uh, problemization approach that you would you would employ. And so this is uh, from uh, Lock and Golden Biddle 1997 uh, article that uh, I talk about in my chapter on introductions. And that I talked, we also talked about in uh, the FTE that I did, the AMJ from the editor's column with Adam Grant in 2011, where we on, on, on setting the hook and writing an introduction. But you want to continue discussing what's incomplete, inadequate, or incommensurable about these conversations that you had set up in your introduction in order to highlight what your contribution uh, to the to the conversation was going to be. Um, this section also then presents your logical arguments and insights that are going to address these deficiencies. So once you've identified what's in, what's you know what's what's missing uh, that needs to be addressed or what the challenges are in the in the conversation that needs to be addressed, this is where you're going to develop the logic, the ideas, um, and and highlight uh, you know how you are going to go about addressing the deficiencies you identified. Um, and your and each of these discussions is going to be followed by clearly stating the hypotheses that you derive from these arguments. And so I'm gonna spend a bit of time talking about um, some of these, each of these different points and issues within each of these different sections. Uh, and then uh, and then how do you, and spend a little bit of time talking about how do you structure the hypothesis section. So first it's important to understand what, what is strong theory? What does strong theory look like? There is an article, and I'll talk about the, what, what theory is not here too, but there is a classic article by Bob Sutton and Barry Staw in 1995 in ASQ, called what theory is not. And uh, they talked also a little bit about what, what theory is as well. And I wanted to start with the, with the is, and then we'll talk about what, what theory is not. But theory at its base is, uh, has simplicity and interconnectedness. It's typically you're taking one or two key ideas, linking them together, and then elaborating on and developing them. Um, most critically, um, there's been a lot of different uh, articles written, some classic ones on what theory is, um, but as real base, theory is answer the question, why? Why does something occur? Okay, when that's what we're trying to do is develop our understanding of the whys, not the what's, but the whys. And that's where, that's where, that's where good theory comes in. 
And that's where people get tend to make mistakes because they send more on, on what's happening in our descriptive as opposed to the why it's happening and discussing the mechanism. So here we're gonna be talking about providing the story and connections between the phenomena that you are theorizing about. You know, why, what acts are observed, events occur, structures, thoughts, or feelings. Why do these things happen, right? And that's, and that's what you're gonna be trying to explain with your, with your theory. Theory also emphasizes the nature, the direction, the context, and the timing of relationships. So you wanna be specific about when these things happen, how they happen, and what context, um, how it unfolds over time, when, it, when it's unlikely to happen, creating some of these boundary conditions on your theorizing as well. Um, it can delve into underlying processes that are involved in the, or it can also go, and it can also go deep into microprocesses. You know, if you really want to kind of take a deep dive into how one thing works, it may go into laterally into neighboring concepts. So you're talking more about the relationships among or differences between um, different related constructs, or it could link something at a particular level up to broader social phenomena. Uh, that you might be try that you might be also um, studying or studying the linkage between at different levels of analysis. So this is what good theory looks like. So what so you know what is not theory? What theory is not theory? First of all, is not references. So references are useful in developing theory, but just making a statement and following it with six citations is not a theoretical argument. Uh, what you want to do when you're using references is look at not just what they found, but also what were the arguments they made to support their findings and integrate those with your uh, with your new insights and arguments to develop to develop your theory. So just providing a ton of citations and references is not theory itself. Theory also is not data. So data is important for corroborating and testing theory, but data does not represent theory itself. It's how we it's how we assess and evaluate and test our theories and see what's right, what is supported, what's not supported and what new or interesting surprise findings we have that allow us to develop or evolve our theory. Theory is not lists of variables and constructs. Con the constructs are, are, are an important part of theorizing, but what you're talking about, you're explaining why these constructs and not others, why, why these variables and constructs are on your list and what's the connections and the relationships among them. So that, that's what the theory is, not just providing a list of constructs and then saying, therefore, here's a hypothesis. Um, theory is not diagrams either. Diagrams are useful in helping explain theory, but they are not a substitute for theory because they are not self-evident and they don't explain themselves. And we use theory, we use diagrams to help illustrate the theory, but the theory still needs to be explained verbally in words. So you don't just put a picture up there and say, that's it. Theory is also not hypotheses or predictions. These are the outcomes of theory not uh, not the theory themselves. And uh, Henry Mintzberg in a 2005 chapter in Great Minds in Management added a, a, one more item to the, this list of what theory is not. He argued that theory is not true. So theory is by nature a simplification of reality. Uh, and, we, and we work with a theory that, that is good enough or is the best theory we've come up with until a new or better theory comes along at which point, you know, Ideally, we move on to a new theory, although Jerry Davis has written several pieces talking about why we don't uh, discard theories even after they've shown to be of, you know, they have not been supported or key parts of them have, have, have not been supported. So a key part of theorizing is at first, in this first section when you're reviewing the literature and establishing the conversation is introducing and defining your constructs. Uh, so the, these are, your, as I talked about last time, these are your main characters and your supporting characters. And Roy Sotheby wrote a really useful uh, AMR editor's comment piece in uh, 2010 about construct clarity. And this definition comes from his, uh, from, from his essay. And so a construct is a conceptual abstraction of phenomena that can't be directly observed. It provides robust categories that sharply distill phenomena and are comprehensible to a community of researchers. So in other words, this is the abstract con conceptual uh, definition or, uh, or category that we are using that when we talk about what it is we're studying. So in my case, reputation would be a construct. And then I might use fortune most admired to operationalize it. That would be a variable, but that's not the, that's not the, repu that's not the reputation construct itself. So the constructs are these more abstract 
uh, theoretical phenomena that we are um, talking about and theorizing about. And so you have to be really clear about what your constructs are uh, in order to develop compelling theory. Because clear constructs uh, offer a variety of benefits. First, they facilitate communication among researchers by having a really clear specific construct People can, will know what you're talking about, one can have a shared meaning about what it is. So we're not using different definitions of the same thing and wondering, well, what is it that you're actually theorizing about? They enhance your ability to conduct empirical research because they allow knowledge to accumulate. If everybody knows how to define a construct and they can develop better measures and more consistent measures of that construct to, to operationalize it in their empirical part of their studies. And that allows us to develop more knowledge about how these constructs develop. If you have lots of different definitions with uh, different components to them, it's really hard to develop consistent measures that are going to be that, that we can develop. So you want to have a clear construct and also stimulates insights into other possible relationships. So it can actually enhance creativity. If we know what the construct is, then we can place it within a, uh, a, a broader network of related constructs and think about, well, how might this affect other things or be affected by other things and really develop uh, a broader set of insights around the uh, what's called the nomological network of, of related constructs. So um, construct definitions. You want to make sure when you introduce each of your new constructs, ideally the first time you introduce them, to define them. Um, if it's a, a relatively common construct, you may not want need may not define them in the introduction, um, or if it's going to derail your introduction by defining too many different things, you might want to allude to that. But in the beginning, or in your uh, in your uh, theory and hypothesis section, you want to clearly define each construct when you introduce them. Um, so your, what's a good definition? It effectively captures the essential properties and characteristics of the concept or phenomena and excludes others. That means um, one of the problems we often see in, in poor construct definitions is, uh, is that the scholars will either include the antecedents of the construct or the consequences of the construct in the construct's definition itself. So rather than define the construct, they define it by what creates it or define it in terms of what it does as opposed to define it in terms of itself and what it is. Um, you also want to avoid tautology and circularity. So you don't want to define the construct in terms of itself. Um, a, a good definition uh, is going to be as narrow as possible while still being general enough to be relevant. If your construct definition is too narrow, it's not going to be applicable in a wide enough variety of constructs. But if it's overly general, then it's going to, if it applies everywhere, then it's really of not much value because then it loses, it loses its meaning. Um, we also find that over time, uh, construct definitions can um, have surplus of meaning um, accrete to them. People add different things or treat them in different ways, especially when we're looking at colloquial or uh, everyday use of the definition or the construct as opposed to more theoretical or research oriented. So you want to be very clear about what is in the definition. And if there are multiple definitions of a construct, why you've chosen the definition you have and what the implications of that are for your, for your theorizing. It's also important when, to, when you're uh, clarifying what your construct is and defining your construct to identify the scope conditions. So when will this definition, you know, when will it apply? When won't it apply? What are some of the, the boundaries on it in terms of space conditions? So the types of organizations in which it may or may not work, um, industries in which it's more appropriate, geographic is, um, contexts in which it may or may not be more appropriate or cultural contexts when it may or may not work. Um, you also want to think about the temporal conditions. You know, so how long will it take for it to occur? How long will it last? Are there certain periods of time in history or, or otherwise where it will work versus where it won't work? So these are all important aspects of, of defining the boundaries of your construct that are then going to shape your theorizing. Um, finally, you also want to identify as lineage. Very few new constructs come absolutely from nowhere. Most constructs build on and emerge from other or prior constructs. And so you want to be clear, especially when introducing a new construct, where does this construct come from? And then what's its relationship to other constructs? So for example, I deal with this all the time uh, in, because I do research on social evaluations and constructs like reputation, status, celebrity, legitimacy um, are all tend to, tend to can overlap in their effects and are relate, closely related to each other. So understanding and being able to differentiate on a theoret 
theoretical basis, what the differences are in the constructs is also really critical, especially when you're introducing a new construct, because you got to be able to justify why do we have it, what, what, what do existing constructs not explain, why do we need it, what does it look like, how is it different, these are all things you have to do in developing a new construct and clarity in that in construct definition uh, and creation and bounding is, is super critical in developing effective theory. So um, that said, moving on to the theory and hypothesis section a bit more. So what, what, are, we, what are we doing in, uh, in the theory and hypothesis section? We're positioning our study rel relative to relevant research when we talk about the, con the conversations. So we're gonna cite relevant work. We wanna focus on the arguments they make, not just their findings. Um, don't argue by citation, as I mentioned. Uh, don't bring in extraneous articles that aren't really relevant to your particular context, but also, and this is a big one, don't ignore important ones. A lot of times you'll be working on your study and a new study comes out and it's like, oh my God, I just got scooped. Um, in general, you can find ways to position your study relative to other studies that seem to be speaking to the same issues that you're, that you're studying. Um, but what I found is a lot of authors oftentimes try to ignore those studies and hope that the reviewers and the editor aren't aware of them as opposed to taking them head on and saying, okay, here's what this recent study has found, but here's how it's different than what we do. So you want to be able to position your, style, your study relative to these other um, related studies as well. Um, and if you're developing your arguments effectively, we should know what your hypothesis is uh, before you, by the time you get to it. So it shouldn't be a surprise what sort of a hypothesis it is that you are uh, developing based upon these, these arguments. In that regard, you want to build a logical argument. So you want to substantiate your hypotheses with explanation and with evidence from prior research or from examples, uh, whatever it may be, um, and focus on how the constructs are related. So the independent and the dependent constructs. Um, if you're using multiple theories, as, as opposed to drawing on just a single theory, make sure you specify why you need each theory and what the relationships among these these different theories are. Why are you integrating the theories or bringing these different theories together that you that you do? Um, and in this regard, you want to make sure that you are, that you have coherence. Um, and one of the biggest challenges I think a lot of authors have, and one of the, the most common review comments you get is. Why are you looking at these these constructs and not others? Why why these? And that if you have an overarching framework that you can place them within, that helps you justify why you've chosen the constructs you have and not other related or or different constructs. So I want to take a couple minutes to talk about um, hypothesis statements. Looks like I'm doing pretty good on uh, on, on time here. So, uh, so, so hypothesis statements are testable relationships among con constructs. Uh, two things, two, they have two characteristics. They must be falsifiable. So you have to be able to, to prove the, you know, to, to fail to support them. And they have to have a feasible null. If we don't believe the null hypothesis, so if we don't find support for your hypothesis, we have to believe that the, the null hypothesis could at least exist. Because if all your hypotheses are supported, but it's impossible to imagine how it could be otherwise, then, uh, then reviewers and readers are gonna question whether or not your hypothesis is really um, a good quality, testable, falsifiable hypothesis. So when you're, and what hypotheses do, hypotheses do is they state what you expect the relationship to look like, not why it will exist. So all the whys come before the hypothesis, but then when you get to the hypothesis itself, this is a what statement. What do you expect the relationships between the constructs to be? Um, and it's important to try to state them in terms of, not state them in terms of empirical measures, but in terms, uh, instead use more uh, conceptual uh, construct-based uh, terminology in your hypotheses. Although sometimes um, it's, you can use con, you know, uh, context-based descriptions, but you don't wanna use empirical measures or variables as you're in your, in your hypotheses. So um, what do hypotheses statements do? First, they're gonna specify the nature of your hypothesis. What's the independent variable? What's the dependent variable? How are they related? So if it's correlational, are they associated with? Are, if there's some sort of a temporal ordering, does it affect? Um, if you can actually determine causality, can you use causal language? And you're gonna use, and so you don't wanna use causal language if it's a, a correlational sort of relationship. What's the direction? Is it positive or negative? You'd be amazed how often I see hypothesis statements where they'll say 
that two variables have a relationship, but they don't specify whether it's a positive or negative relationship or when it's positive or when it's negative. Um, what's the strength of the hypothesis, especially if you're doing comparison hypotheses, what do you expect the effects of relative uh, constructs to be? And this is uh, particularly important in mediation and moderation types of relationships too. Um, what's the shape of the relationship do you expect? Do you expect it to be linear? Do you expect it to be curvilinear? And in, in which way is it gonna be a positive U shape or a, a, you know, a, a U shape or is it gonna be a, an, invert, an inverted U? Uh, is it going to be log linear? So maybe starting out slow and then accelerating or going up fast and then and then uh, and then uh, tapering off. What's the range over which it holds? Is there a temporal range, a categorical range, you know, et cetera? So there's some, are there some range limitations on it. Um, and if you're doing uh, mediators or moderators, what are the intervening variables and how do you expect them to affect uh, the the main effect relationship that you that you've already identified? So um, hypotheses typically take, there, there are three main types of hypotheses that we generally see. Um, the first is if-then statements. And, these, and this applies equally for main effects hypotheses and um, moderator hypotheses. So an if-then statement is, takes the form of if X, then Y. You know, so it'd be you know, the positive effect of X on Y is weaker if it, in an interaction if Z is high or low. So um, something less abstract. Um, that uh, female CEOs will be paid for with equivalent performance will be paid less than male CEOs. If a female, then less pay. That's an if then type of hypothesis. And uh, as an interaction, we might say something like um, the positive, the positive effect of or the negative effect of gender on CEO pay will be weaker in more egalitarian countries than in less egalitarian countries. Another type of hypothesis is a continuous statement. And this is the, you know, the greater the lesser the value of X, the greater the lesser the value of Y. The larger a company, the more the CEO is going to be paid. That would be a continuous statement. Uh, and, and with an interaction, the term that we would say that the, the positive relationship between X and Y will be stronger, the greater the value of Z, whatever the, whatever the moderator is. So the relationship between uh, firm size and CEO pay will be greater the higher the firm's performance. Would be an example of a, of a continuous moderator hypothesis. So the third type <clears throat> are different statements. So this is where we would argue that, for example, um, X will have a greater effect on Y for category A than for category B. So we have, so we have some sort of a comparison that we are making between uh, be between two measures. So uh, the um, the effect of of media coverage on the likelihood of CEO dismissal will be greater for um, high reputation CEOs than high status CEOs would be would be an example. Um, you know, X will have a greater lesser effect on Y than Z will have on Y. Um, would be another 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 form another form of that, um, and then for a moderator, X will have a greater effect on Y when Z is high or low than when Z is is low or high. So these are we're making these different these comparative differences in the in the hypotheses. So, but um, making sure you have clear testable hypotheses that define all these different characteristics, and if you've developed your theory well it will all flow from this. And so all these key elements you should have already been discussed and then your hypothesis summarizes these arguments and saying here, okay, here's what the relationship is that we expect. Um, so structuring the theory and hypothesis section. So, the, uh, so there are a variety of different ways you can structure them and a number of different factors that influence how you would structure them. I'm gonna go through them briefly here. Um, if you've bought my book or seen my book, um, I have a table in there and I go into this in more, in more detail, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna go kind of fast. But one of the key factors that's gonna, that's gonna affect how you structure your hypothesis section is um, how you're problematizing the intertextual field or the conversation. Um, so if you're using progressive coherence uh, with incompleteness or inadequacy, um, you're basically working in one theory, within one theory. Um, and so, that, so you're gonna go more, in a more sequential way. So you're gonna have the review, of the literature, the conversation, the limitations, what's needed, 
what the new relationships look like and why. Um, if you're using a synthesized or non-coherence uh, problemization with uh, in, with an inadequacy or incommensurability, that you may have. This is going to involve multiple theories, so it's, so it's not a single theory thing. So you're going to have to first place your theories within an over, that overarching framework that I talked about that compares or integrates them. Um, you may do this together, followed by your hypotheses, or you may do it sequentially. So you have your framework, theory one, hypotheses, theory two, hypotheses, et cetera. Um, whether or not you're introducing a new construct or using existing constructs. If you're using existing constructs, um, you can introduce them all together as in the, perhaps in the front end of your paper or sequentially as you develop your story and they unfold. Um, you want to define them and relate them to the other constructs and to your new theory. If you're developing a new construct that hasn't been uh, hasn't been seen before, then you have to you'll want to do this right up front because you're going to have to establish the need for this construct. You're going to have to define it, identify the scope conditions, compare it to other related constructs, demonstrate how it's different. So this is usually done before you know before you can develop your hypotheses. You have to develop fully develop your new construct and why it's essential and what it looks like and how it's different. Um, the number and roles of your main characters can also affect how you structure your theory and hypothesis section. So if you have a single main character um, and it's a, and it's the uh, you typically discuss them earlier at the beginning of the section. Um, if it's an independent variable after you define it, you might then discuss how it's going to affect your different supporting character dependent variables. If your main character is a dependent variable after defining it, um, you'll discuss how, how it will be affected by your supporting character independent variables. If you have multiple main characters, you have a bit more, you have more options. You know, so depending upon whether or not it's the main character, the main characters are, are um, an IV and a DV or all IVs. If it's all IVs, you may introduce them sequentially um, and the story lines as you need to. If they're, if they're um, an IV and a DV, you may want to introduce them both up front or do the DV first and then the IV. It depends on, uh, on how your story best flows. So the number and roles of supporting characters. Um, so if you have a so if you have a single supporting character, um, your IV can introduce. If it's the IV, you can just introduce it when it comes up to you in your in your storyline. So oftentimes it'll be a moderator. So you would talk about your main characters, and then you would talk about your moderator, and you would introduce it at that point. If it's a dependent variable, um, you're, even if it's a, a supporting character, you're still probably going to want to introduce it early so that you can develop the IV main character stories relative to this dependent variable. Um, and if, it's, if you have multiple supporting characters, whether or not they're IV or the DV, typically introduce them as you move through and as they fit most appropriately in your, in your storyline. So finally, how do you use context? So this becomes a, a big and can, and can be a contentious issue depending upon the reviewers because some folks don't like to see context at all in the theory hypotheses in section. I am in the other camp where I think it's kind of essential to use and employ your theory and context uh, to help um, illustrate and develop your story. So um, if you're using your context to help create a human face and to ground your theory um, in examples, uh, you may decide to introduce it early. So you can set up and say, and develop your arguments within and using your context as examples of your theoretical arguments. So in this case, you might do it either right before or right after introducing your main character. So you might. So in other words, you would have the first part of your, of your theory and hypothesis section would be context, and then you develop your arguments, or you can introduce the main characters, here's the context, then start developing your, uh, your hypotheses. Um, another option is to use it to create some breathing room, especially if you have a really complex theoretical story. What you might wanna do is do a short introduction of your context, and then introduce more of it as you go along and spread it out so that you can, so you might introduce it after your general theoretical argument, and then use it as examples before each of your spirit, uh, specific hypotheses. So your sections might look something like general theoretical argument, specific contextual example, hypothesis. And you'll go along and use that same kind of, of structure for each of them. Um, there are some contexts um, that really you can't talk about ahead of time. If you're doing a lab experiment um, or if you're just doing a more general study of say like S&P 500 companies, um, you're probably not going to be talking about your context, your con, uh, your context up front. So, um, so you typically you do this after you're developing your hypotheses, or perhaps at the beginning of the methods section. So, but uh, you know, and you can do this with other studies too. But I tend to find that the context-free theorizing 
uh, studies are a lot harder uh, and less engaging to read. So, um, so that's the end of the, uh, the hypothesis, theory and hypothesis section. So I'm gonna, I've got about five minutes. I'm gonna try to get through some of the discussion section stuff here. So as I said, the discussion section is the denouement. This is where you make sense of what happened and bring your story um, to a close. So uh, it's gonna remind the readers what your research question was because it may be a while, been a while since you actually stated it. Um, it answers the question by summarizing what you found. So now you're finally delivering the goods, but this should not be the whole discussion section. This should be like a paragraph. Um, it's gonna place your study in the broader context of the conversation you constructed earlier in your theory and hypothesis section and explain, and you're gonna explain how the conversations change as a function of your study. You're going to speculate about any unexpected findings that you have, um, and, you know, either in your hypothesis test or in your um, in your postdoc analyses, and what you know what ways these create new theoretical insights. So the discussion section is an area where new theory can be developed or presented. It's not just in the front end. Um, it, you're also going to, but you're also going to identify the practical implications of your theory and findings, acknowledge their limitations and the implications for future research and then finally conclude your story. So um, some common discussion uh, section mistakes. One is rehashing results. So just resummarizing your results again for the third or fourth time, but not drawing theoretical implications from them. So just saying what you found and not saying how does this feed back to your story. Um, making superficial interpretations. Um, and this usually goes along with rehashing results. So you don't go beyond restating general theor ar theoretical arguments um, and you, or you don't tie it back to the broader conversation. Um, meandering is another common mistake um, where you go all over the place and introduce theories that aren't discussed previously. So if, if you've seen a discussion section where people are trying to introduce three or four new theories that weren't part of the theoretical discussion and hadn't shown up in the paper until this point, then the authors are meandering. Um, Overclaiming is, an, is, is another. So making, so in trying to sell your, the, your study and show how important it is, you make overly extravagant claims about your contributions that go way beyond what your data shows or that you can um, reasonably support. So how do we avoid doing some of these things? What should we do to develop our theoretical implications? First, go back to the introduction. So discuss, this, you know, your discussion section, I'm sorry, should, uh, should repeat uh, the research question pose and the introduction and then answer, and, I'm sorry, go, yeah, and then answer it. Um, Answer the questions, what do we know, what we don't know, and so what, what will we learn? Uh, your contributions in the discussion should match the contributions identified in the introduction. This is a big one. So the three or four things you list in your intro saying our study makes the following contributions, those are the same things you should be talking about in the discussion section. If you have stuff that's missing in the discussion that was in the introduction, you need to add it. You know, if you have stuff that's in the discussion section, it's not in the intro, you either need to add it to the intro or you need to just to, uh, um, to remove it from the discussion section. Um, you also want to talk uh, talk about the you know discuss your contributions the same way you problematize them. So as an incompleteness, inadequacy, and commensurability approach. Um, go back to the theory and hypothesis section. So the results are the what's, when's, and where's. So you need to return and focus on the why's. So we're going back to the why's again in the discussion because this is the theoretical part. Um, summarize the logic supporting your hypotheses that were supported. Um, speculate, as I talked about, speculate about unexpected findings for future theory and research, and you can move up a level of distract of, of abstraction uh, to making more general theoretical claims as opposed to more context dependent claims. Um, and make sure you address alternative explanations at this point. Um, make sure you talk about practical implications, translate your insights into managerial actions. Um, don't just re, you know, restate them or restate your theoretical findings as uh, as practical implications, look for some, you know, look for what's going to be interesting to practitioners. Uh, if you've made a methodological contribution, talk about that as well. And uh, make sure you talk about your limitations. If, a, if a authors do not identify or acknowledge any limitations in their study, it makes us question whether or not they actually know what they're doing because all studies have limitations. Um, so you want to acknowledge them, but to extent possible, also show how you've addressed them why they aren't a big concern. If you have empirical evidence you can provide, it's always better than just pure arguments, but argumentation, if that's the best you can do is, is, is what you should do um, and discuss their implications for interpreting your findings. They, they put boundaries on what you can actually claim. And this kind of goes usually to the overclaiming as well. Um, 
talk about future research and you know and associated with your limitations what sort of opportunities the limitations of your study create for what future scholars could look at using different methods for example or with different samples um, and finally you want to include a short concluding paragraph that's going to bring your story to a close so um, don't just say what your results were again and don't call for just call for future research try to tie it back to your introduction in some way and have some sort of a concluding sentence that shows how we're now in a different place um, than when we started at the beginning of your article. So, you know, try to find a good way to put the bow on and uh, and ride off into the sunset with your with your paper. So um, that's it. I think I'm in 40 minutes. I think I did okay. So um, I'll go ahead and uh, and do you want me to leave these up or do you want me to turn them off? Um, you can leave them up if you want to. I think okay. we have a few questions. Okay, yeah. So yeah. I know that, I know I know that was fast. So sorry sorry about that. But uh, hopefully, um, got the got the, uh, the the gist of it. Okay. So what can I what can what, what questions can I answer? Okay. So um, let's see. So going back to the hypothesis and theory section there were two questions about um, okay. one about um, construct clarity being a prerequisite for a good topic so it was a question about so wouldn't there be a construct cl clarity about the topic even before thinking about hypothesis and theory development yeah i mean you constructs can get clarified over time, right? So, I mean, if you're introducing a new construct, it's, it's not going to be as clear as a construct will ideally be 10 years from, you know, when it's, when it's first introduced, because there's going to be new theory that, you know, that identifies its nuances, that clarifies that maybe takes away certain parts or emphasizes others, but you have to have as, as clear a construct as possible before you can start theorizing about it, because otherwise, you don't know what you're theorizing about because you, you don't know what the boundaries are. You don't know what the, the mechanisms are supposed to be associated with it. You don't, you know, if you, if you don't know what you're talking about or what you're theorizing about, it's hard to develop the why arguments. So you have to have at least some rudimentary boundaries and, and, and definition of what your, of what your construct is. And most of the stuff we work with in our field, um, has been previously used. We're not, we're not doing new, developing new constructs so much as using existing constructs in different ways. So, um, so, that, so that you should be able to, to clearly define your construct before you start developing your arguments. Does that help? Thanks, Hassan. So Sushant, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Um, does that answer your question? Okay, okay, great. So there's a, actually another question from Sushant, which is about um, writing hypothesis. So among the three forms that you have suggested, which one would be the best for writing a mediation hypothesis? Um, it, de it depends, a, a lot of it depends on your, um, on your constructs. So let me get these up here. So it depends on if you, if you have a, um, a continuous or a categorical measure and what the nature of the, of, of the mediation is. I mean, they, you know, they, they tend to be, uh, I mean, if the, if the mediation is a category, for example, if the mediator is a category, a categorical variable, if it's binary, it's gonna, you're gonna, it's gonna sound different than, or the hypothesis is gonna be different than if it's a continuous construct, for example. So if it's like one, pro it's like it was, if you're doing like a process type of argument and there's a process, that's a cognitive process that's mediating, um, it's probably gonna be more continuous. If it's a, um, if it's some sort of a binary, if this exists, then we'll find something else, then it might be a if then statement. So, so if it can be present or absent, for example, and it's just a, and it's just a binary outcome. I'm trying to think of a, of a good example off the top of my head. So, um, so we would say that uh, the, uh, we might say that the, uh, whether whether media coverage uh, affects the uh, you know a, a, a firm's neg the neg negative ne the coverage of a negative media event for a firm affects firm performance is going to be mediated by and it might be partially mediated or it might be fully mediated so it may be partially mediated by 
uh, the firm the firm's reputation. If the if if they are high reputation, it will it will have it will affect them. And if it's not, then they won't. So that would be more of an if then type of statement, right? So, but you might also do it as a continuous uh, hypothesis if there's a more continuous mediator. So again, it could I think be any any of these three. It really depends on the nature of the construct that you're working with and their and their relationships. Does that help? Thank you very much for that. And yes. <laughs> okay, so um, before we move on to the discussion section, there's another question about how to integrate international context when you're writing um, writing about it. So if the data comes from international context, should it be introduced early on in the paper or maybe talk about it later? Um, good question. I mean, it depends on, on how you're using the international context in your, um, in, your, in your theory. So if you're arguing, for example, when I talked earlier about boundary conditions and the oh, construct no. clarity, if you're if you're arguing that uh, that for example something is if you're using say a Chinese context and most of the theory has been developed in North American context and you're going to say this is going to look different in China in this way and the construct doesn't work this way and so you're you're explicitly making context you know um, international context or cultural context a boundary condition of your theorizing that should come up real early I mean if the arguments would be the same in any context and you just happen to be using for example, you know, for example, Chinese firms as opposed to British firms or U.S. firms, then you um, then it, then it depends more on how you want to use it. You know, according to some of these other these other discussions. But I would say that if it's a um, if it's a key part of your theorizing, you're saying that yeah, this is all you know, especially like in corporate governance, we see this because it's all been done based upon essentially ten thousand large U.S. publicly traded companies. And if we're talking about small firms, if we're talking about Firms in uh, in different countries in different contexts, um, you're going to see you're going to see a big difference. Eunice's uh, former advisor Pierre Fiss had some really cool papers in this, looking at governance in German versus U.S. context, and talking about how the differences in the in the in the German context led to differences in how some of these governance mechanisms operated. So. Okay, thank you very much for answering that question. And and, and before I move on, I, I forgot to mention too that um, on my website, I've developed a bunch of exercises, writing exercises you can use. And one of them that really applies to, to this part of it is I developed it, I call it um, Theory and Hypothesis Tetris. And what I've done is suggested ways to kind of systematically go, you write your paper, write as an exercise, write your different sections of your paper in chunks. And then, and then I talk about how to systematically rearrange the pieces and read them. Um, and next one can sometimes help. Some of them will make no sense and it won't work at all. But the point of it is that sometimes it forces you to think about these things differently. And when you read them in a different order than would maybe be your natural inclination, you find a way of organizing them that actually works a lot better than you um, than you would have anticipated. So, uh, so the, so if you do the so if you do some kind of mix and match and just move the chunks around, you may find that hey, this is actually a more effective way to tell a story or to unfold this than um, than I was originally thinking. Because we tend to anchor on our initial our initial approach, and I'm just in that exercise. I'm trying to force you to more systematically explore options, explore your options. A lot of them are gonna suck, but some of them, are, some of them might be pretty interesting. Okay, thank you. So um, yeah. I just shared a link to Tim's website and you can check out the exercises there and you can also learn more about the book. So please check it out. A couple more questions about theory yeah. and hypothesis. Mm -hmm. First is, um, could you elaborate more on not theorizing by citation? Oh. Sure. So, um, so theorizing by citation, what we typically see is as an author will make a statement and then have like a whole bunch of citations afterwards, but they won't justify or develop the statement. So what you want to do uh, to not theorize by, by citation is to, if you cite a study, you want to be, you want to talk about what did they find and also what were the arguments that they made that support their findings and how does this relate to the theory you're building? Because typically what you're gonna be doing is, is either making some sort of theoretical claim and then providing support for it, or you're gonna be, or you're gonna be using that the prior theory as a launch point and then moving on to what it is that's new and that, you, and that you're contributing. But if you just make um, assertions 
with citations, but don't connect the dots and, and provide the logic, then you're really making arg an argument by citation. And so um, if you're getting a comment, often a, if you have a bunch of citations, but then you get a comment that, you're, uh, that your hypothesis is under theorized, then probably you're doing more argument by citation uh, than, than, you, uh, than, you, than you may realize. And so you wanna think about what does each study say? And that's why you don't necessarily need to cite you know, six or eight studies for every point that you're trying to make. You might have two or three that are really, you know, or one that are really the most relevant and that you then build on and use to, uh, to, to develop your argument and to integrate with your new ideas as opposed to just you know, throwing a site out there and assuming that everybody knows what every paper is about and we'll, and make, and we'll make all those links in, in, in logic themselves without you having to do it for them. Okay, thank you very much. And another, I think this is the final theory question. So some believe that theory is in the eye of the beholder. Please, could you comment on this view? Um, it is, it, what is a theoretical contribution and whether or not theory has been sufficiently developed is inherently subjective, right? And so there, there are gonna, you're gonna run into some reviewers that, um, that are never gonna be satisfied. You're gonna run into others who, um, who don't care that much, right? And so um, every, every, in the review process, um, every review process is a negotiation. So especially once you get past the first round, if you get an R&R, &R, you are now negotiating with the editor and the reviewers over what your paper is going to look like. And so there may be some trade-offs there, but you have to listen to what other folks say. You can't just, you know, if, if somebody tells you your work isn't theoretical enough or it's not, it's not theoretically well-developed, um, you need to, and it helps if they say why, right? And if you're a reviewer, if you're making that sort of a comment, tell the authors why you think that is, okay? And what they could do about it. Um, unfortunately, we get lots of reviewers who just make the statement without, without giving their rationale. And so you're left to guess a little bit, but usually it's going to be looking at these things like, are we missing why statements? Is it, are we not bringing in the right kinds of literatures? Are we, are we developing each link in the chain of our, of our logic and developing our, our argument? And then, you know, whether or not ultimately something is considered interesting or not, or of sufficient magnitude, it does tend to it does tend to be um, to some extent subjective, but that's where if you do a really effective case building your argument why this is important why we don't know what we uh, you know what you are studying and you are finding that's part of your job is to persuade people that what you are doing is in fact interesting, and sometimes you know as a reviewer and an editor I've had to tell authors that they're underselling themselves that there's something way cooler here than they're giving themselves credit for and encourage them you know and and, show, and help them to make it. Uh, Help them to make it a, uh, a a bigger contribution than they're even, than they're even acknowledging. And other times they're way over claiming, and you have to kind of scale them back a bit. So, but um, but yeah. So it's it is somewhat. And that's the frustrating part about this. But you know, if you if you make a good persuasive argument, then people are generally going to buy what you're selling and accept and say, yeah, this is really interesting and this is new theory. That's where you have to be complete and recognize the literature and do all these things I was talking about. Yeah, I think that's a great segue to the next question. So what do you think is the difference between speculation and overclaiming? Um, speculation is, you know, I mean, overclaiming is when you're asserting things, right? So you're saying, we found this, we show this, you know, this means that um, speculating uh, is, is more qualified, you know, so this suggests that it's possible that, you know, one implication might be, you know, it, but then future research needs to continue exploring or here are some of the limitations and why, you know, we can't make a, a strong claim about it. So it's when you make these kind of, you know, bald assertions without, you know, that really kind of go beyond what it is that, you, that you've shown um, as opposed to doing it in a more qualified way. And uh, I think that's oftentimes the, the, the biggest difference. So, um, and even then, some people might say you're 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 going too far, and it's okay, fine. Then you take the speculation out. But um, but I think it's that it's that doing it in a more kind of circumspect, qualified way, as opposed to a, you know, this is it, and being you know being overly assertive in your in your statements, around around these these things. 
Okay, so somewhat related to that, um, how do you generalize your study's finding, especially when it comes from international settings? Like how much claim can you make in terms of generalization? Yeah, I, it's funny because, you know, when, if you're doing it in a North American context, nobody asks you to generalize it to international typically, but if you're doing an international study, everybody wants you to say, well, how's it generalized beyond, you know, your, the country that you're, that, that you're studying? Um, you do it by showing examples where, where else it can apply, right? And that's where examples are really important, especially in the discussion section. So if you are using a context that may seem, that may seem kind of unique or specific and people are gonna question, well, how does this generalize to other contexts? That's the discussion section issue, right? And so what you wanna be able to show is that, you know, we do, we can see similar kinds of things in other related contexts and it might be in other countries or it might be in other industries. It might, you know, whatever, it, it, you know, what, whatever is gonna be, is gonna be relevant for you. But try to find some place that's gonna, you know, some other context that's gonna look similar enough that you would expect this stuff to apply. And, you know, there's also the, you know, it also may be the case that, you know, even if it doesn't go beyond a particular context, it's really important to understand it in that context. So, uh, so it doesn't, it doesn't have to necessarily, you may not generalize really well, but that's also why having a, having to be ground, your constructs be grounded in more general theory and being able to move up to a more general theoretical discussion of your implications, as opposed to just discussing them only within the context of that, of, in which you did your study can be useful and also hope showing their generalizability because you're talking now about the more general theoretical relationships among constructs as opposed to the specific context, but your context may provide an important boundary condition. Okay, so a couple more questions about mm -hmm. the discussion section, and yep. I think these two could be related. Um, so some people say there should be three big contributions and others say it should be under one big contribution. So what do you think you should be writing about when it comes to the number of theoretical contribution you're making? And related to that, let's see, if you are drawing from different theories, would your mm -hmm. theoretical contribution focus on one overarching context or should you also discuss about those different disciplines that you're drawing from? So it depends on how you problematized um, your, your study. So that kind of goes back to, the, to, to this issue, right? So, um, so, so, so in terms of the number, I think the number of contributions you should cite should be the number of contributions you make. Um, you know, don't make up a third contribution if it doesn't really exist. Um, you know, but at the same time, I think authors tend to look at papers. If you only make one contribution, they're going to question how, you know, is this, is this study too incremental, right? Are you really making a significant contribution um, if, if you're only making one contribution? So are you, are you really thinking hard enough about, you, do you know the theory well enough to understand what contributions you are, are making? Um, three has always been kind of a magic number, you know, it's for, for contributions, we usually see three in the introduction, three in the conclusion, and there might be some other, um, you know, speculations beyond that. But in general, you know, two to three to me seems fine. You might have four, right? And they, and you might have a, you know, three, three, uh, or two uh, theoretical contributions and an empirical or methodological contribution. That's fine too, right? So you want to think about the, you know, the overall, contributions you make, what you don't want to do is claim like six or eight contributions and you don't contribute to every literature ever, ever um, written either, you know, so you want to be more specific in terms of the theories. It depends on how many theories you're using and how you employed them. If you're bringing two theory two two different literatures together, um, your findings may have um, implications for both of them because it, it's two, comp, two discussions that weren't had two, two discussions occurring in parallel that you've now linked. And so each one may have some implications for the other. Um, it may have more implications for one, one theory than the other, or it may resolve differences between two competing theories. So it, it really, there's no kind of, this is the one answer. It's gonna really depend upon the nature of your, of your problemization uh, the, and the story, you're the story you've told and what you've found. You know, so, you know, so you may find that you're, you might have been developing hypotheses that could have contributed to two different theories but they only pan out for one of the two. So that's fine. 
right? So th those, that's the one you would discuss. But it just, it all, so it all really kind of depends. But what you want to do is be consistent. So you don't want to claim more, you know, discuss more theories than you were theorizing about. Um, you know, and you also want to make sure that you don't ignore theories. You know, why did you introduce this one if it then disappeared from your paper? Which we see sometimes too, people will introduce a theory in the front end and then never talk about it again, right? So if, you, so if you're developing it, make sure you talk about it, you know, or, you know, or, or come back to it in some way in the, uh, in, the, in the discussion section. So don't just have things be kind of, you know, kind of disappear off into the ether <laughs> on, on an unfinished storyline. Okay, thank you for answering that. And I think uh, one of the last questions we have is, um, is the discussion section for a qualitative paper different? And if you can, can you give some highlights of your chapter on the qualitative studies? Yep. Yes, it is. It is different. Um, in in uh, in some in some in some key ways. In some ways, it's not right. So, but the but the discussion section in a in a qualitative paper um, is where the theory development actually the new theory is actually explicitly occurs in a in a qualitative paper because it's an inductive study. You are inducting new theory, so you're not starting with theory that you're then testing. You're developing new theory that you're then discussing. So you're, so the, the front end, there's some differences in the front end, but the discussion sections typically are longer. Um, you're doing more new theory development discussion. You're linking it, you know, but you're still linking it back to, to existing theory or showing what the implications are. Um, you're typically bringing up a level of abstraction from your, uh, from your findings section, which is where you're really talking about things specifically in your context. And you want to link it back to the, uh, to the more general theoretical discussions in the in the discussion section and show what's new and what you're contributing. And so in that regard, they tend to be a little bit longer than quantitative uh, discussion sections and they tend to have more new theory development in them because uh, you're not just rehashing your findings uh, or talking about, okay, here's what we found. It's gonna be more of, oh, here are the implications of what we found here and then, and then linking them back to the ongoing discussion. So, um, but then you're still gonna have some of the other, all the other pieces about, you know, what are the, practical implications, what are the limitations, you know, that kind of stuff. So those, those parts are all going to be the same. Okay, thank you so much. And okay, I'm asking for a few final questions. Sure. Okay, so um, yeah, I think this question was already answered about generalization and going back to the hypothesis development, um, Nikisha asked a question of to what extent should you discuss counterfactual theory of your causal claims? Um, so, I mean, if there's an alternative argument that you want to, uh, that you need to rule out up front, you may want to address it there. But if you don't address it there, then you definitely probably want to talk about it in the discussion section, right? So if there's a counterfactual, if they say, well, this would negate what it is you're arguing about, you, that may be, uh, be something that you save for the discussion section and then talk about there, right? And, and that's where you would address alternative explanations, um, which you may have already then addressed or ruled out somehow in your robustness tests or uh, post hoc analysis too. So it kind of depends upon how much it's gonna derail your story. Um, you know, and you know, if, if, you're, if you're not dealing with that alternative or doing a comparison type of type of study where you're saying this this literature finds this but this other literature finds or argues the the opposite um you can use that to set up why there might be some uh, you know some incommensurability or some uncertainty and how you're going to go about resolving it what if it's a straight up well there's this alternative explanation and here's this counterfactual example um you may want to do that in the discussion section as opposed to in the theory and hypothesis section uh, it really kind of just depends on the on, on, on the situation, but what you don't want to do is go, go off on a tangent and have this long this alternative discussion about what the you know what this might also look like that then derails the development of your story. So, um, but you can foreshadow, for example, with a footnote or some, or you know some other way in the in the body of the text that there are alternative uh, options where there might be some, you know, there might be uh, examples that, that suggest that this is inconsistent. I will, I will address these and then say wherever you're gonna, you're gonna be addressing them to kind of signal people it's like, yeah, I know this is there, I'll get to it, right? So that the reviewer then will, will wait as opposed, to, as opposed to start going off on it right there and kind of 
getting derailed themselves. You want to keep your reader on task and on, on track too, and not have them going off into going off into the weeds as well. So. Hey, thank you so much for answering all these questions, Tim. And I sure. think we've went over time a little bit. So thank you so much for staying with us, everyone. Um, Tim, do you want to talk about your upcoming showcase symposium? Yes. So uh, let me get to the end. Sorry about that. Um, so like I said, I had the, the writing exercises out there, but I, uh, I have a showcase symposium that was accepted for, at AOM on the art of storytelling and academic writing that uh, my co-organizers, co Ace Bjorkia and Ashley Rockapriori and I put together. They're both doctoral students here at, uh, at Tennessee. Our panelists are gonna be Jerry Davis, Kim Elsbach, Adam Grant, Ben Hallen, John Hollenbeck and Violina Rindova. So we've got a mix of um, macro, micro, qualitative, quantitative, um, some international, different, you know, got, you know, some old people, some couple younger people uh, who are going to be talking about uh, different elements and different aspects of, of using language and storytelling in their, in their academic writing. So we're going to have about a 50 minute moderated Q&A that I'll moderate and then we're, or I'm sorry, a panel discussion and then we'll have about a half hour of Q&A. So um, I hope you all be able to join us. I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great powerhouse panel and uh, that I'm that I'm really excited was that we're all all agreed to participate in this and it should be a really uh, a really interesting discussion so um, so that's it okay so thank you so much and before we say bye um, it will be nice to take a group photo together so if you don't mind could you please turn on your video so that we can take a picture together thank you so much so um, once um, Tim sends me the slides, I'll be sharing the slides with you. And the recording will be also shared on the STR YouTube channel. So please make sure to check it out. And the picture will be taken in one, two, three. Smile, everyone. OK, thank you so much. So if you want to join us for the writing session, it's an individual co-working time. You can stay here. Otherwise, thank you so much, Tim, for doing this for our members. It's a great pleasure to have you. We learn so much and we look forward to learning more from your book and your upcoming symposium. So thank you again so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me and thanks for, you know, for organizing this. I think it's a great event for the strategy division members and I think it's, you're providing a, a fantastic service. So I'm happy to be able to participate. So thanks everybody for getting up early, staying up late or joining us in the middle of your day. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. All right, bye-bye. Okay, bye.